All right. Hi, everyone. I am very, very pleased to welcome you uh, to the session on corruption and organized crime. I'm um, very happy to see such a great interest. We have more than 110 participants all over the world. Um, my name is Alexander Kupatadze. Um, I am a lecturer at uh, School of Politics and Economics at King's College London. Uh, I will be moderating this session um, as well as I'm one of the presenters. Uh, but just a few sentences about the general housekeeping rules. So we have four presentations. Uh, each presenter will have 10 minutes to speak. Uh, please hold off your questions uh, towards the end of the session. Um, uh, and please make sure that you send the questions uh, in the chat box. Um, we can pick it up from there. Uh, but during the presentations, could you please keep your microphone on mute um, and your video turned off? Um, so uh, I um, am meant to go first. So let me just share the screen um, and um, try to put up my slides. So uh, it's uh, pretty much a project in uh, development. Well, we are toward the end. Um, uh, we have uh, done significant part of the field research already. Uh, so I will be able to share some of the preliminary findings. All right. So uh, we, we saw that there is uh, this extremely blurred line between organized crime and corruption. Uh, and I think we have plenty of empirical cases um, to prove this point. Um, uh, I think one of the most recent cases of, of El Padrino, the Mexican uh, law enforcement official being arrested for drug smuggling uh, is very illustrative, right? So um, in cases um, uh, of Latin America, Africa, Asia, you name it, we have increasing involvement of state affiliated and state embedded actors in different types of criminal activity. But on the other hand, if you uh, look at the um, organized crime uh, literature that is um, um, primarily the focus on, on mafia type groups and non-state actors. Uh, in fact, if you, if you ask many people, uh, they would uh, define organized crime in non-state kind of underworld uh, terms. Um, uh, but uh, on the other hand, we have this growing evidence of high level state complicity in, in criminal markets. Uh, one of the organizers of, of this uh, conference, a Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, um, I think just recently has published a report um, on African organized crime index, where they say that um, uh, mafias are, are negligible. The, the key actors in organized crime scene are the state's uh, embedded actors. So it looks like uh, that uh, the state's affiliated actors, they are uh, organizing crimes much more than, uh, than, than we think. Um, and in fact, there's, there's some logic in it, right? Because states are wealthier, they have uh, more capacities, more capabilities, they are much more powerful than non-state criminal networks. Uh, and it, it is often not the um, problem of enforcement capacity. Um, it is often choosing not to enforce the law. Uh, and I've done lots of research in, in Central Asian countries, um, the, the countries like Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, these are known to be weak states. Um, but in fact, they have um, uh, very good enforcement capacity when they choose uh, to enforce the law. Uh, but often they don't choose to do that. Uh, they often abuse their, their power uh, for, for, for private benefit. Um, and uh, the predominant way to look at this uh, uh, is uh, via the lenses of protection theory. Uh, that is, um, the uh, politicians or law enforcement officials, they're providing protection to uh, non-state underworld actors in exchange of, 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 uh, of a service or the bribe, uh, right? Um, and in this kind of uh, equation, um, the politicians or, or law enforcement officials, they're rather seen as, as a bit of passive actors um, uh, who are uh, only accepting, accepting, uh, sorry, accepting the bribe uh, in exchange of, of, uh, of uh, providing a service. Um, uh, but, but it looks like it, it goes beyond protection. Uh, looks like that we have very substantial evidence um, to say uh, that uh, the state embedded actors, they are directly involved. Uh, so what we did, we uh, looked at illicit trade 
in consumer products. Uh, well, why consumer products? That uh, there's a different issue. I'm happy to discuss it if there are questions about it. Um, uh, well, one of the most um, uh, important um, reasons is that it's uh, a bit easier uh, to get data on, on, on this type of uh, uh, illegal trades. Um, and we looked at six countries. Um, well, in, in, in three different regions, right? We looked at Eastern Europe uh, and we picked Montenegro and Ukraine in, in, in that region. We looked at North Africa, uh, looking at Morocco and Libya and Paraguay and Argentina in, in Latin America. Now it is not um, strictly methodologically um, designed paired comparison to control all intervening variables. No, we just wanted to have some kind of variation on uh, state capacity and um, state willingness and commitment uh, to enforce the law and uh, to see uh, if that has uh, some kind of explanatory power for the varying uh, extent of involvement uh, of state actors in, in organized crime. Uh, so we found two researchers in each country. Uh, some of them are still working. Uh, well, COVID has interfered a lot. Uh, so now I hope we are back on track. Uh, we have done more than 70 interviews so far. Um, and all the data is, is coded um, in Atlas TI. Um, and we are trying to develop some kind of typology, right? What, what are the forms of involvement? How exactly are the state affiliated actors involved in this? Uh, and of course, primarily, one of the most important uh, forms is, is protection. Uh, that is when uh, the people uh, in the position of power, they um, provide protection uh, in exchange of uh, uh, bribes. Uh, it can be systematic uh, bribery uh, or corruption like uh, funds for the political party, and we have lots of cases of that. Um, or it can be just one-off transactions. Uh, or protection can be uh, also provided through uh, uh, creating the demand for this protection, that is by victimizing or harassing um, uh, organized crime uh, groups or semi-legal entrepreneurs. Um, another form of this is, is forbearance. Um, uh, that is uh, basically protection uh, via non-enforcement or, or turning a blind eye. That is, states are tolerating smuggling in certain regions, for example, because they want to cop the local elites um, in in in, uh, in some kind of uh, um, uh, cohesive state structure, and that's the only way to do to to, to do so sometimes. Um, or they want to create alternative employment for the local population, um, and that is a number of. Uh, benefits uh, for, for the purpose of social peace, or there are different types of security arrangements. We often have the cases when smugglers, for example, they provide intelligence information uh, to the law enforcement structures, and in exchange, a uh, state provides uh, protection to them. Uh, but we are finding lots of evidence for direct participation. That is, uh, medium and lower ranking um, law enforcement officials or other bureaucrats, they are smuggling products themselves very often. Um, or in other cases, they uh, often um, own the shares in the companies that are involved in different parts of supply chain. There is either counterfeiting or import-export operations uh, or, uh, or transiting and transportation uh, of, of, of the illegal goods. Um, so, yeah, as I said in this last sentence here on the slide, mounting evidence for direct participation category. Um, uh, but also looks like this role of state affiliated actors is not static and it changes um, uh, in, in different parts of supply chain. Uh, for example, we have a politician, an example of a politician who owns the shares in um, the uh, company that produces counterfeit cigarettes. Uh, and, and, and in this case, he's directly involved in this. Uh, but when it comes uh, to the policies towards uh, illegal trade in border regions, um, his role changes into more a facilitator um, or turning a blind, blind eye role. And often this involvement depends on, of course, on the type of product um, uh, and illegality plays a significant role here, of course, um, uh, even though we need a bit more research for, 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 for on that. I mean, uh, I think the illegal networks that are involved in, in smuggling, they have very few qualms what they are smuggling, um, even though there's some evidence uh, that they uh, they are more connected to smuggling of cigarettes, for example, than uh, smuggling in arms that is a bit more um, uh, dangerous for reputational and other reasons. Um, also, involvement depends on, on power arrangements in, in the political system in the countries like Ukraine, where security agencies play a very important role um, uh, historically, and this is partially past dependence because of Soviet kind of policing 
uh, tradition, they have very strong um, capacity uh, to police the society, uh, and they play a very important role in, in illegal as well as illegal markets. Uh, but in other cases like Morocco, um, where military plays a very important role in state formation and state making, um, they also managed to negotiate their role in uh, different legal and illegal markets. Um, and this may further blur the distinction between corruption and, and organized crime, because if you look at corruption as kind of social allocation modes where public resources um, or illegal resources are distributed based on uh, particularistic arrangements. Right, um, then that is uh, basically what is happening when different um, state embedded actors are participating uh, in, in uh, different types of, uh, of illicit trade. I, I, I'm very keen on time, so I think I've, I've ran out of, of, of my time. Um, so I will uh, leave it there. Um, and please, um, if you have any questions, uh, send it to me in, in, in the chat box. Um, let me. Um, I'm not sure how to, yeah, stop share. All right. All right. Um, so uh, next is uh, Dr. Carlotta Carbone, uh, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Faculty of Political Social Sciences at University Cattolica del Sacro Cuore. Um, so, Carlotta, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, I'm sharing my presentation here. Um, okay, I, I think you, you see the presentation, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So I can start. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm very glad to, to have the opportunity to present my PhD thesis. Uh, on collusion in public procurement. Uh, the title of my, of my presentation and of my thesis is uh, um, Bidding Behaviors Associated with Bid Rigging in the Italian Public Procurement. Uh, so the aim of my work was to understand how cartels behave and interact in procurement and which opportunities they exploit and under which circumstances. So the specific research question uh, of my work was which are the bidding behaviors associated with bid rigging? No, no, ma quello va bene. To answer, uh, so, sorry, uh, to answer this question, I made uh, three hypotheses. Uh, so first of all, uh, according to many competition authorities, uh, uh, cartels use consortia and subcontracts to discourage competition on the one side, and also to uh, split profits among their members. Uh, despite this, there are very few empirical studies on this. Uh, based on this knowledge, I expect that colluding companies are more likely to exploit such legal opportunities in order to collude, so they misuse opportunities that are legally available in the procurement market to rig tenders. And the second hypothesis uh, is that colluding companies uh, massively participate in uh, public tenders. Indeed, recent studies showed that uh, cartel firms tend to frequently and exclusively participate in procurement among themselves, and they submit similar prices uh, to increase uh, their giant probability of winning. The third hypothesis uh, is that cartel companies switch between different colluding strategies. So they will avoid to rely on a specific technique, so on a single technique, but they will uh, and they will avoid to um, attract the attention of law enforcement and competition authorities by diversifying their strategies. So for my research, I used a procurement data set including 357 auctions in the construction sector. Uh, all of them were investigated uh, by law enforcement in the Apple-Topple investigation. Um, the total number of companies uh, participating in these contracts was uh, 1,242, 9% of which were colluding, so they were part of different cartels. Uh, on this data, I performed a logistic regression analysis uh, uh, in which the dependent variable was a uh, dummy showing whether the company was colluding or not. Um, and here in the table, you can see the list of uh, independent variables. Um, that I expected all to be positively correlated with the outcome. Uh, 
so I use the number of offers uh, uh, submitted by uh, companies, uh, uh, the number of uh, awarded tenders, uh, uh, the number of times they form temporary consortia or they bid similarly. So they submit similar offers and whether they got any subcontract. Uh, as you can see, I also used measures of embeddedness and brokerage power that deserves a little more explanation. Um, embeddedness measures uh, the extent to which companies participate We lost your voice, I think. Hello, Carlotta, are you here? It must be some kind of technical issue. Um, Carlotta? All right, um, looks like we have some technical difficulties. So, so let's go to the next speaker. And when we have Carlotta back, um, we can give the floor back to her. Uh, so next is uh, Dr. Franklin de, de Vrieze, who is a senior governance advisor at the Westminster Foundation for Democracy in London. And he will be presenting on Parliament's relationship to anti-corruption agencies. Uh, Dr. de Vrieze, please. Thank you very much. Let me see if this works. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I will speak today about the relationship between two institutions which are central to any system of accountability, uh, accountability within democratic governance, and that is parliaments and anti-corruption agencies and the contribution of uh, parliaments to the functioning of uh, anti-corruption uh, agencies. Now, on the role of Parliament in combating corruption, um, I think we can highlight a number of specific issues. And of course, the first one is and foremost, Parliament's role is to exercise its oversight role to the fullest. That is, I think, very effective uh, as a basis for combating corruption. It's also about adopting relevant legislation related to specific topics of anti-corruption, such as financial transpar trans transparency, whistleblowers, beneficial ownership legislation, they all go through Parliament. It's also about approving national plans and strategies on anti-corruption, and it's about the relationship to uh, independent oversight institutions and anti-corruption agencies, and that's the issue I'm going to talk about uh, today. Now, there are currently more than 150 anti-corruption agencies in over 100 countries. However, I think we can say the evidence of their impact is mixed. The evaluation of their performance is often, I would say, sobering. And the sibling blocks can be related to external issues such as the lack of political will or high political interference or inadequate rule of law and justice systems. But sometimes it has also to do with institutional design issues. So specifically, how the independence and the accountability of anti-corruption agencies is being uh, regulated. And some countries, mostly in established democracies, they often build the capacity of existing law enforcement agencies rather than creating new institutions. However, we see that in many countries in transition and um, in countries where the rule of law does not function properly, they often choose to establish a separate anti-corruption agency as a publicly funded agency uh, combating corruption. So, um, but indeed anti-corruption agencies are often established in a context which can be quite uh, challenging. So uh, what we talk about today is address this stumbling box to overcome this, and that is uh, the role of parliament. So we are actually speaking about the constructive role of parliament in overcoming the challenges which anti-corruption agencies are facing. 
And so there are uh, three types of anti-corruption agencies, uh, depending on their mandate and context. So we have multi-purpose anti-corruption agencies with um, some uh, law enforcement powers, uh, often including also preventive role and an investigative role. Then we have law enforcement agencies, so with a focus on investigation, sometimes also prosecution, and they are often part of specialized police force or specialized prosecution office. And then we have the third category, the prevention and policy advisory anti-corruption agencies, which focus more on awareness raising, education, policy analysis, um, and sometimes also asset declarations or codes of conduct. So the key question which we have been looking at is how can the stumbling blocks on the effectiveness of anti-corruption agencies be overcome? And can we develop an uh, assessment framework on the role of parliament uh, in, um, in strengthening the independence of anti-corruption agencies? So we are looking at five criteria, five dimensions, um, related to the role of parliament in establishing a legal foundation, the leadership, the resources, the reporting, and, and the cooperation. And so what we have analyzed is how can we measure parliament's role regarding their interaction with anti-corruption agencies. And so in order to measure that, we have identified 26 indicators, uh, indicators which helps us to assess uh, whether parliament has a leading role or a rather support role in um, the functioning of anti-corruption agencies. So I will now go um, briefly through these uh, five uh, criteria. And the first one is regarding uh, the legal framework. So of course, um, Parliament has a key role in that and securing a legal foundation is of course a condition for a strong anti-corruption agency. And this legal foundation is, um, can be based in the constitution of the country or in the legislation, depending on the political system. For instance, in the Maldives, um, where I've worked, um, there it is the constitution which has established the anti-corruption agency as a constitutionally ranked institution. So that provides a strong guarantee against any possible uh, abolishment of the institution. Another indicator is around the clarity of mandate and the strength of the institutional uh, objectives. Um, so also there, Parliament has a responsibility through the legislation it adopts and through the statutes of the uh, institution. And it's there, I think, important to be clear on the division of responsibilities uh, with uh, other institutions. Other indicators are related to the legal guarantees of institutional independence and, of course, the functioning of the, uh, the independent functioning in practice, whether the anti-corruption agency generally operates independently um, and whether the operations are conducted in an independent way. So this is the, the first area, the legal framework. The second one is around uh, the role of parliament in the leadership and in selection of the leadership. And I would say that best international practices advises that parliaments do have a role in the selection and the appointment of the leadership of anti-corruption uh, agencies. Now, um, the way how the nomination and the confirmation of the leadership is conducted is a very relevant indicator for independence of the agency. So, and of course, the extent of the involvement of parliament and government depends on the specific political system. But as far as the involvement of parliament is concerned, uh, I would um, highlight a couple of uh, examples. So we have here, for instance, a couple of countries mentioned. Uh, for instance, in Indonesia, the parliament is uh, directly involved in the selection of the commissioners of the Anti-Corruption Commission and they select them from a short list prepared by a multi-stakeholder committee and then submitted through the president. In Slovenia, for instance, also there the parliament participates in a committee with various other stakeholders, including actually anti-corruption NGOs as well as the Judicial Council. So these are interesting examples of parliament's involvement in the appointment of anti-corruption uh, agencies leadership. Um, a very important indicator is also, as we all know, a merit-based and competitive selection of the leadership um, of the agencies. And there, the role of parliament is often very specific related to identifying and confirming the criteria for the selection of the leadership and the, identifying the minimum requirements, but also the timely appointment. And we have seen a number of situations where a parliament sometimes take a very long time in order to confirm and vote on the selected uh, leadership for 
uh, independent institutions and anti-corruption agencies. And one example I remember was in Serbia, where two years ago, Parliament took a very long time in order to confirm the leadership of the institution. And then we have here a number of other uh, indicators um, around collegial decision making and, and other indicators. So these are key issues around uh, Parliament's role in the, um, in the uh, interaction with the uh, agency. The third one is around resources and Parliament plays a critical role in allocating the financial resources for the work of the anti-corruption agency. But also Parliament should uh, control whether the government is, for instance, allocating optimal premises for the anti-corruption agency, which sometimes is a problem. And Parliament should make sure that the labor status of the employees is suitable for this type of uh, oversight body. So independence does not mean lack of accountability. <clears throat> Accountability is actually crucial to ensure the credibility and the public trust for the anti-corruption agency. And accountability has to do very much with the way how the budget is being uh, man uh, managed. And here you have a number of uh, indicators uh, mentioned. And so the allocation of financial resources to an anti-corruption agency is, I think, a key indicator for this relationship uh, with Parliament. And Parliament needs, of course, approves the annual state budget. And so Parliament needs to foresee that there are sufficient uh, budgetary means uh, foreseen. Now, a specific issue here is the third one, um, uh, often the topic of, of heated debates. And that's around the authority of the anti-corruption agency to prepare its own budget. And I think it is vital that the anti-corruption agency is given the mandate to draft its annual budget of course, in accordance with the macroeconomic context and aligned with the general applicable rules uh, regulations for, for the budget process. And an interesting example here is uh, Montenegro, where the Montenegrin law on the prevention of cor corruption provides that uh, financial independence for the agency, which means that the agency can propose its own draft budget directly to the parliament. The parliament then determines this budget and submits it to the government and the government needs to accept this budget and can only make changes if it has a justification in writing and submit that to parliament and then parliament and then the agency can decide independently on the use uh, of the funds so i think that is an interesting um, example another uh, indicator is that of course the uh, parliament uh, the anti-corruption agency needs to have the authority to execute its budget and there we see that sometimes uh, the budget can be reduced during the course of the financial year which is of course a means to pressure the agency um, or that there might be other ways of um, interfering with the allocation and the implementation uh, of the budget so I think these are uh, interesting points as far as resources is concerned. And then finally, very briefly regarding reporting, um, I think the annual reports are uh, an important um, um, standard requirement for anti-corruption agencies. And they are typically submitted to those institutions which were responsible for the appointment of the leadership. So that means actually parliament or a mixture of parliament and, and government. And legislation governing anti-corruption agency establishes reporting obligations. However, our research indicate that this is not very consistent. And there are often very few specifications about what should be included in the reports, the annual reports of the anti-corruption agency. And again, here an interesting example is Ukraine, where the law on the Ukraine anti-corruption agency provides a very detailed overview of all the types of information which need to be included in the anti-corruption agency's annual report. Now, in some countries, these reports get um, marginal attention and very few um, follow-up. In other countries, there is more systematic approach to analyzing, debating, and following up to the conclusions of these reports. So I think that these reports do provide valuable analysis and information on uh, the state of uh, corruption in, in the country. And then the last uh, dimension is around cooperation, where um, the, an important issue is, of course, the anti-corruption agency doesn't function on its own. It needs to establish cooperation with other state agencies, private sector, civil society, and other agencies for investigation and, um, and prosecution. And of course, also uh, international cooperation, particularly for the transnational uh, cases and transnational uh, crime. So in conclusion, um, I want to say that there is a solid body of research on the design and the operational factors on the success of anti-corruption agencies. 
which is very much related to the independence of the uh, agencies. And I think uh, our research uh, and also the various case studies we have analyzed outline opportunities for Parliament to be, I would call it, the guarantor of the independence of the anti-corruption agency and also the contributor to its effectiveness. So that is my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, time um, is, is uh, we, we were just on time. So th thanks for that. Um, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I also have some good news. So we have uh, Carlota back. Um, Carlota, please. Yeah. Continue. I'm so sorry for, for this. I lost the connection for a very few seconds. So uh, I can restart my presentation now and hopefully the connection will be more stable. Um, okay, so I share the screen. Okay, so you should see my screen again. Uh, so as I was uh, explaining before, so maybe I can restart from here. Um, so as I told you before, um, I ran a logistic regression models to detect which are the bidding behaviors that uh, identify colluding companies. And so I use different measures that are uh, commonly used to detect uh, uh, cartel companies. And plus, I also added this embeddedness and brokerage power that I, I wanted to explain, explain you. Um, so um, I was explaining the figure. So uh, the, the red companies in the middle of, of the figure in the, uh, that are part of the core uh, of the network are the ones that have uh, denser connections among each other. Uh, so this dense connection may, uh, may explain that they are uh, participating as a group of companies to re that rig tenders and they are not playing as a single uh, bidders. So this is what embeddedness is telling us. So um, colluding companies may participate all together to discourage competition of uh, external companies. So uh, companies that are external to the cartel may be discouraged from participating in a tender because they see that many uh, bidders uh, are colluding in the tender, so it makes no sense to uh, make an effort uh, uh, in order to participate in the tender because they are going uh, basically to, to lose. So that's the, um, the reasoning uh, under this measure. Well, brokerage power um, measures the extent to which companies are strategic and successful bidders in procurement. So companies with a high brokerage power may on the one side facilitate collusion uh, because basically they uh, ease the formation of collusive ties by acting as intermediaries in the network. Um, so if you look at the red company in the figure um, on, uh, on the left, you, see, you can see that this company connects groups of companies that would be otherwise unconnected. So it plays a strategic role in the network. Um, so by connecting these groups of companies, uh, it may facilitate the, the rise of a cartel, so the rise of collusive ties. On the other side, uh, companies with high brokerage power can also sustain collusion. Uh, indeed, from a descriptive analysis that I carried out, uh, it emerged that these companies were particularly successful. So uh, they get a higher number of contracts compared to others. And this was especially true uh, with uh, regard to uh, cartel companies, as uh, uh, the scatter plot uh, shows. Um, I would like to summarize uh, the key results that I get before getting more in detail into the models. Uh, so overall, uh, the results show that cartels exploit legal opportunities to collude. So they form temporary consortia and the subcontracted works uh, to rig tender, so to discourage uh, competition on the one side, but also to split profits among all their affiliates. Uh, the second key result is that colluding companies uh, tend to massively participate in procurement. So in this way, 
they discourage competition of the other companies and they also protect themselves uh, against internal threats because by participating all together in tenders, they uh, have the opportunity to monitor each other's behavior. So uh, embeddedness uh, um, is both useful for protection against internal and external threats. And the study also showed that cartels diversified their strategies. Sometimes they um, indeed massively participate in auctions, but in other cases, uh, uh, they prefer to submit few but stronger bids. Uh, to, to uh, fight against non-colluding companies. So they form temporary consortia or they relied on brokers in order to submit uh, stronger bids when they cannot count on the great participation of uh, their members. Uh, so I want to um, show the results uh, in better detail. So this table shows uh, regression models that are in support for the second hypothesis on massive participation. I run this model uh, on, at first on the world sample of auctions and then on, only on tenders. Uh, on majority cartels and wing cartels are uh, two different samples. The majority cartels include um, auctions uh, in which the majority of participants were colluding while uh, the win cartels include only those uh, awarded to cartels. So here, the results is that embeddedness is a good indicator of collusion, especially in tenders uh, where the majority of participants uh, are colluding. As I said to you before, by bidding all together, uh, these companies discourage others from participating in the tender because they constitute a big group of companies. Uh, and others are discouraged to participate. And uh, in these auctions also, the uh, colluding companies tend to submit very similar prices to cover uh, the greatest possible price range to increase their giant probability of winning. And this strategy, uh, so submitting similar prices revealed to be particularly successful to get contracts. Um, this table instead is, uh, uh, shows exactly the same regression models as before, but here I would like to focus my attention on variables in support of the first hypothesis. So here, what, what minutes to wrap up? Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, here I just wanted to say that um, this hypothesis is supported because the cartels are more likely to use consortia and subcontracts in general, but it's not always the case because uh, uh, we can see that in, uh, um, in uh, auctions in which the majority of participants are colluding, um, temporary consortia, for example, is a less strong indicator. Um, and the reason is that um, in, uh, I, I'm showing uh, just additional models to conclude and to explain this, uh, um, this issue. So uh, in auctions where the majority of participants are colluding, uh, disregarding whether uh, cartels wins or not, cartels rely on the great participation of their members to discourage competition. So they don't really need to uh, form consortia to uh, fight against uh, non-colluding companies. While in auctions uh, awarded to cartels, but in which the majority of participants are non-colluding companies, Cartels tend to form consortia and to rely on brokers because uh, um, few of them are participating in that uh, tender. So I, I know that I'm uh, out of time. So uh, I'm sorry for, for this and for the connection problem. Just to sum up, um, the, my thesis showed that cartels use different techniques to rig tenders. They both exploited the legal opportunities uh, for rigging tenders. They relied on embeddedness to face internal and external threats, but at the same time, they also uh, used other strategies depending on the, on the context. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Carlotta. Very interesting. Sounds like an extremely well-designed study. Thank you for that. Um, so next we have uh, Dr. Tininio who is a comparative political scientist um, with more than 20 years of experience in international development. And now she's senior technical director at MSI. And she will be talking about USID 
technical guidance on interventions. So Dr. Virinio, the floor is yours. Okay, great, hi. Uh, so I can't start screen sharing until the other participant has stopped, it's saying, so. Uh, do I need to? Uh, you need to stop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm trying to do that. Okay. In any case, um, hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this novel 24 hour conference and share my research with you today. It's fitting for me to be part of this panel as I'm coming at the issue of organized crime from an anti-corruption background, uh, starting as USAID's first anti-corruption advisor in 1996. I've focused on anti-corruption for more than two decades. I've focused on organized crime for about a decade now and see the two is very closely linked. Um, so for the past two years, I've, I've led research, I think there we go, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, is this, um, can anyone tell me if this is working? Alexander? Doesn't look like, no, we don't see your presentation. No. We can't see your presentation, not yet. All right, sorry. One more little technical glitch here, so. Yes, that's good. Okay, so um, for the past two years, I've led research to examine lessons learned across USAID's programming to counter organized crime. The programming has addressed a number of organized crime sectors, uh, trafficking in persons, wildlife and natural resource trafficking, drug trafficking, counterfeit pharmaceuticals, and gang crime. In addition to a literature review and five roundtables, one which was held in partnership with the Global Initiative, our research looked at hundreds of project documents and talked with over 100 staff from USAID and implementing partners. This is all fed into the drafting of USAID's technical guidance on countering organized crime. While the technical guidance is not yet ready for publication, I wanted to share some insights with you today. In the research, we looked specifically at the issue of government compl complicity in organized crime. And as seen in this first slide, uh, government complicity occurs along a spectrum. The extent of complicity is largely determined um, by the quality of governing institutions and especially the rule of law. When the rule of law is weak, criminal organizations are more likely to offer bribes and officials are more likely to accept them or engage in criminal activities themselves since they perceive the risk of doing so to be low. The degree of criminal infiltration also reflects the scale and scope of the criminal activity. As criminal activities become more visible and complex, it becomes necessary to co-op higher levels of the state, essentially moving from low-level bribery of customs or law enforcement officials to higher-level officials. Higher-level complicity is also more likely where illicit money is concentrated in fewer hands and represents a greater share of national income. For crime groups, high profits make big brides more affordable. For senior officials, high profits in illicit markets represent a notable source of wealth and power in the country, which they may seek to tap. This is especially true where there are fewer opportunities for making money in the formal economy. Strategies for tackling government complicity depend on the extent of the complicity and the opposition to crime at different levels of government. So this slide shows four scenarios for reform. The best scenario is found in the top left box where complicity is confined to low level officials and high level officials oppose organized crime. The box is shaded green to suggest that an array of initiatives can support anti-crime efforts. The next best scenario is found in the bottom left box where complicity is confined to low level officials, but opposition to crime is weak. Mobilizing political pressure for reform may provide the best lever for advancing an anti-crime agenda in this scenario. The second worst scenario is found in the top right box where some officials 
some high level officials are complicit and some oppose organized crime. Reforms are possible, but may face strong backlash and careful analysis of stakeholder interests and resources is necessary to identify possible entry points. The worst scenario was found in the bottom right box where high level officials are complicit and relatively few high level officials oppose organized crime. So direct, direct interventions with government are not advisable, although support for civil society and international advocacy may be warranted. Countering state complicity requires efforts to strengthen accountability, as this next slide shows. Accountability operates through multiple channels. Uh, horizontal accountability entails the checks and balances in government, um, as Franklin was just talking about with parliaments, anti-corruption bodies, ombudsman offices, justice institutions, among others, as uh, serving as a check over other institutions. It also entails internal systems, such as uh, internal affairs departments, information management systems, and inspector generals. Vertical accountability entails efforts by citizens to hold officials accountable through such mechanisms as oversight boards, complaint mechanisms, citizen scorecards, investigative reporting, and elections. In addition to these accountability measures, uh, mobilizing uh, domestic support and lining with international initiatives can also shore up uh, political capital for reformers to sustain efforts. Uh, for example, the Open Government Partnership, which brings together government and civil society to promote a more open government, may provide a platform for strengthening government commitment to reform. In context of significant government complicity, the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, CICIG, uh, and the Anti-Corruption Hybrid Court in Ukraine represent possible models to consider. Where high level officials are complicit in crime, a flashpoint may be needed to mobilize the population against powerful uh, interests. Electoral fraud, revelations of government involvement in crime, or the assassination of anti crime fighters are the kinds of flashpoints that have mobilized large numbers of people to demand reform. So I'd be remiss to leave the discussion of initiatives to counter crime here. Uh, alongside these many accountability initiatives are a range of interventions to prevent and prosecute crime, as you can see in the first column of this next slide. It's important to keep in mind the whole panoply of interventions to understand how they fit together. Accountability initiatives are part of um, what, we, what, I, what I'm calling the prosecution side to curb illicit behavior. Um, and those are the ones in the bottom half of this slide. It, prosecution takes aim at the risks for engaging in criminal activities, which could include imprisonment, um, fines, debarment, visa sanctions, and loss of standing in one's community. Prosecution focuses, focused interventions aim to, uh, aim to increase the risks of engaging in criminal behavior. Uh, they strengthen laws on criminal activities and the capacity of police, prosecutors, and judges to enforce the law, drawing on uh, such tools as surveillance, undercover police, informants, witness protection, and asset seizures. The prevention side, so there's that top half, um, is taking aim at the incentives for engaging in illicit activities. By incentives, I mean the factors that prompt someone to engage in criminal activities, such as limited opportunities in uh, illicit, you know, formal markets, or the lure of wealth and status. We can say need and greed as a shorthand. A range of development programs aim to prevent crime by reducing uh, these incentives for engaging in it. They may promote alternative livelihoods through training, credit, supplies, technical assistance, and infrastructure. They may also fund education, health services, recreational activities, and psychosocial support. In addition, development assistance supports community co-management of natural resources, such as forests and mangroves, and formalization of resource rights and land titles to enable community members to benefit from listed activities. Other programs aim to shrink criminal markets. They strive to decrease demand for illicit goods and services 
through social and behavior change, communication, and advocacy for more stringent laws. Efforts typically focus on specific illicit goods or services, such as rhino horn or conflict minerals. For some of these efforts, development practitioners have joined a growing number of consumers, investors, activists, policymakers, and corporations to call for su supply chains that are clean, that is you know, free from unethical or illicit activities, such as child labor, human trafficking, armed conflict financing, or illegal harvesting of fish, trees, or other resources. Support for clean supply chains ranges from traceability and certification schemes to customs operations. Practitioners use these varied prevention and prosecution approaches across criminal markets. In general, an array of prosecution approaches applies to all criminal markets, whereas specific prevention approaches apply to many, but not all criminal markets, as you can see by the check marks in this slide. What I want to emphasize is that preventing crime is a necessary complement to prosecution. <clears throat> As one interviewee in Guatemala noted, in the case of extortion, we can arrest every gang member, but if youth aren't given opportunities, new gang members will emerge. Similarly, an interview in the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo commented on minerals trafficking. People go the illegal route because there's no viable legal avenue. In high crime contexts, prosecution is needed to disrupt criminal networks already in operation, but prevention is needed to reduce the ongoing supply of new participants. To some extent, prosecution is the short game, but prevention is the long game. So final point is that political economy analysis needs to guide these interventions. Efforts to strengthen accountability may quickly stall if those involved have a strong stake in the status quo and only engage in this type of programming to take down their opponents. The use of political economy analysis and thinking and working politically can help find potential openings and understand and navigate complex and shifting landscapes. So that concludes um, my comments and thanks very much for your attention. So let's- Thank you very much. Very informative. Uh, thanks a lot. So um, we have some questions already. Uh, and let me go uh, by order in which they appear. Um, the first question was to uh, Dr. Vieze. Uh, so they're asking, could the panel share their thoughts on incentivization of anti-corruption agencies where they have investigation, investigation and prosecutorial, prosecutorial powers and can therefore apply for proceeds of crime confiscation? Uh, so, yes. Yeah, please. Yes, thank you very much. It's a it's an interesting question, and it's um, yeah very much related to um, the autonomy of anti-corruption agencies to generate their own financial um, revenues. Um, I mean, in some countries, anti-corruption agencies are indeed entitled to impose fees and fines to those who violate uh, the rules and the regulations. Um, and so, depending on the individual case, sometimes these funds go directly to the anti-corruption agency's budget, or in most cases, they go actually to the central state budget. And so the question is indeed, uh, can the anti-corruption agency, in line with the existing rules, uh, take some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, revenue? And for instance, in Pakistan, according to the recovery and the reward rules, the anti-corruption agency can receive a 2% share of the total recovery um, it has made. Uh, and that is, of course, um, a percentage, an amount of money which is given to the budget of the agency as a whole. It's not about individual remuneration. Now, the critical point here is, of course, that this needs to be a surplus. This needs to be an additional amount to the um, annual allocation and, uh, and not something which makes up for certain budget cuts, which might be uh, created during the course of the implementation of the budget. So there we see a, a short uh, pitfall. But indeed, um, some agencies which have investigative and prosecution uh, powers um, sometimes can uh, rely on um, recuperating a percentage uh, of the share of the uh, recovery. And it gives them a, a larger autonomy, of course, um, that, and strengthen their independence. Thank you very much. Um, there are 
two questions to me. Well, one is the next one is uh, addressed, yeah, I think to me, and there's another one that I can pick up on. Uh, so, did your research give any indication of what is behind the increase in the amount of state actor organized criminal activity? And what was there any indication of what levels of government are most usually involved? Um, yeah, thanks. Interesting question. Well, um, it's difficult to say it increased or not because we, we don't have the historical reference points. That is, we don't have a historical data that would allow us to compare, right? I mean, we cannot say it increased. Uh, maybe it did not. It, it, it remained the same. But um, we, we know more uh, than we did before. Um, so difficult to say that it increased indeed. Um, and which levels of government uh, are most usually involved? Well, I think what the preliminary findings are is that often the agencies that are tasked with policing a particular activity, for example, police that, that has to fight against drug smuggling, and they are more prone to abuse their power and, and get involved in this kind of organized crime. Um, uh, if we talk about smuggling, smuggling of consumer goods or, or um, other cross-border criminal activity, then the obvious suspects are customs and border guards, just because they are at the front lines of this. Right, um, and uh, about the levels of government, uh, it often depends on the quantities of, um, of uh, how much is smuggled and uh, how lucrative it is, right? I mean, the more lucrative uh, it is, um, the, the higher involvement it gets, and it gets uh, more attention from the uh, higher ups. Um, and usually it's, it's organized in, in kind of pyramid structures, that is, um, the border guards uh, at, at the border um, passes part of the fee that he collects to the uh, to the uh, people up the chain of command, right? But but sometimes it's not. Um, I mean, even in most corrupt uh, settings, we have been told that um, uh, sometimes um, the smugglers have to know uh, which is in charge of, of of the border post or or customs post in that particular day. Um, that is. Uh, the implications of this is that it looks like there are some honest um, uh, custom officers and honest border guards and honest, honest policemen in extremely corrupt settings as well, uh, right? Otherwise, the smugglers would not consider this kind of um, uh, information as, as, um, as a very important one. Um, and also, the, the, there was another question. Did your research discover a percentage of successful prosecutions, judicial outcomes when the intelligence analysis package which originated from the anti-corruption agencies was passed to the authorities for judicial process uh, uh, that we didn't look at uh, i mean we, we have we have some court data even though it takes lots of um arm wrestling to get the court data in, in some countries we have some court data even though limited uh, but we did not um uh, have the access to uh, the this kind of um uh, information, so I, I cannot comment on that. And the next question is um, more general address to the panel. Um, could you please share your thoughts on whether you think that corruption is one of the main factors that makes weak states more vulnerable to organized crime? So I don't know who wants to take on this question. I guess I can jump in. I, I, I think in my, um, my comments, I was uh, suggesting that weak governance uh, more broadly is the biggest uh, factor, uh, which explains the level of organized crime. But I think, um, you know, more specifically, I, I mentioned rule of law, and I think uh, most indicators uh, would point to a very high correlation between rule of law and corruption. So it, it's kind of hard to, to parse it out, but I would say, yes, corruption is a big uh, factor explaining levels of organized crime, which by, by that I would say rule of, you know, rule of law, weak rule of law and weak governance are part and parcel of that. Thank you. Just just to add a few sentences, uh, I think it's uh, sometimes very unfair to categorize countries into weak and strong uh, because there are weak states with some strengths and strong states with some weaknesses, right? I mean, if you talk about Central Asian countries or, or African countries, for example, I mean, some of them are known to be weak and, and, and extremely corrupt and with a problem of organized crime. 
but as I said, enforcement is not an issue very often. Um, I mean, the security agencies of Kyrgyzstan can be as good as security agencies of Germany if they choose to be, um, so for example, to unravel some terrorist networks. Um, but they often do not choose to be efficient um, and they abuse the power uh, for their own private benefit. Um, Carlotta, um, the question is, your research is, is really interesting. Uh, I'm so sorry that your link was, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't need to read that. Uh, do, do you plan to widen your research to other European states? Uh, honestly, it's my dream to, uh, uh, to extend my research to other European states. Uh, unfortunately, it's really difficult because uh, the main uh, difficulty that I had in uh, uh, to my thesis is the, the part regarding the data collection. So it's really difficult to find the data uh, on all the participants in tenders. So in most of the cases, you have only the, the winner of the tender. Um, for example, some years ago, I participated uh, in a uh, EU-funded uh, project called uh, DigiWista, an Horizon 2020 project. Uh, a very big project on uh, corruption in procurement, not only in procurement, but uh, let's say that this was uh, one of the main topics. And uh, in that project, we collected many data on procurement, but only uh, they only included the winner. It's really difficult to find data on participants. And I struggled a lot. I think it was one of the main difficulties that I had. Uh, for another project we are carrying out at Transcrime, uh, which is called Data Cross. Uh, we are trying to collect uh, this data. Uh, for now, we we were not really lucky. We tried to collect them in France, in France and uh, in Spain, but apparently um, there are not uh, very good data. So in Italy, there is something. So um, I think uh, there is uh, even I will have uh, the opportunity also to expand this uh, research in Italy and uh, hopefully also in other countries, depending on uh, on the data. If you, uh, maybe if you have uh, suggestions on the data, they are really welcome. Thanks, Carlotta. Next question is to Dr. Di Nino. Um, even we opportunities exist for young people to earn a decent salary legally, would you agree that socialization plays a great role in what individuals choose to do to earn? Yeah, thanks, Michael, for that question. So it's uh, really good to have more nuance to this discussion. It was a very um, brief kind of high level discussion of, about interventions, but you're absolutely right in that, um, you know, with, with alternative livelihoods and trying to address sort of the economic push that gets, uh, you know, some people to be involved in criminal markets, um, there's more to it than, than, than just that, clearly. You, you know, in some cases, there's the role of identity. Um, there, there is a role of uh, violence or um, you know contexts of, of insecurity that might be prompting some people to uh, you know engage in criminal markets. There's also um, you, you know the, the the role of uh, socialization and culture, as as you allude to, which can be uh, important. And 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 I and I think the um, a lot of the social and behavior change communication um, does get at that, which is a sort of necessarily necessary complement to, to some of the alternative livelihoods work. So um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and the next question is to all panelists. How do small island developing uh, states such as Caribbean countries with a culture of corruption among political directorates who makes the corruption laws how do they begin to change that culture? Anyone wants to take this question? Yes, maybe a couple of words from my side. Um, I mean, in such, um, in such circumstances, I would recommend a couple of points. Of course, it's important to have the appropriate legislation, um, the enforcement of legislation, but there are also other issues, I think specifically regarding uh, anti-corruption. Um, we have done some interesting research on the effect of anti-corruption campaigns. So when a, a public awareness campaign is done about uh, what is corruption and that people shouldn't do corruption, 
uh, it doesn't always lead to a diminishing of corruption. Actually, uh, what we've seen in a couple of countries is that um, very strong anti-corruption campaigns on themselves uh, can lead to a sense of um, discouragement, maybe hopelessness among people saying, well, it seems everyone is corrupt because we get so many warnings about corruption. So, um, you know, is it ever going to change? Um, I think uh, another approach is um, to have campaigns not uh, pro-integrity. So if you have um, campaigns which are encouraging people to be uh, to, to have high um, adherence to integrity and it's also rewarding um, in integrity, that often has a very positive effect. And I've seen a couple of um, initiatives, country case studies, where, for instance, um, there is a reward given to high level and middle level civil servants related to the level of integrity and the level of uh, ethical conduct. And when these issues are clearly communicated and advertised, it often has a very good effect. And maybe, maybe it might even have a, a more uh, sustainable effect than um, broad anti-corruption campaigns as such. I mean, this is one of the findings of some of the research. I know it's controversial. Some people would not agree. So um, I would be interested for any feedback on that. Great, thanks for your answer. Um, we don't have any further questions. So um, does any of the panelists have something to say for in, in the minutes? We want to, if you want to share anything, uh, feel free to, otherwise we will close the session. Well, um, thank you everyone. Uh, it was very good questions, very good answers. Thanks a lot. Thanks to the organizers. Um, thanks to the volunteers who helped a lot. Um, they are behind the scenes, but they do a great job. Um, and uh, looking forward to uh, other sessions today and tomorrow. So thank you everyone.